And sometimes the, what we think we're saying out of our mouth and what somebody else may be hearing are two different things. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. I'm Kim Skorupski, and on today's Triple H, the Habits and Hacks from Hopkins, I have a really interesting guest, folks. This is Mr. Jeff Natterman. Jeff, how are you? Hey, Kim, thanks. I'm fine, and thank you so much for inviting me to the Faculty Factory to participate in this discussion today. Well, thank you. Now, listen, everybody, you're really going to have... Quite the ride here because I'm going to have Jeff introduce himself and tell you who he is here at Hopkins, and it's going to be kind of scary. It's spooky. Jeff, tell everybody who you are and what you do here at Hopkins. So I am the Chief Legal Officer for Risk Management, Regulatory Affairs, Ethics, and Patient Care for the Johns Hopkins Health System. Bum, bum, bum. Cue scary music here. And, and the folks, you can't see Jeff because this is an audio, but he and I are smiling because I was sharing with him before we started recording that I'm like, every time any faculty member sees anything or hears anything or God forbid gets called or emailed from anybody at legal, we get a little scared. But Jeff, I promise you, is a very kind man. And he was telling me he gets five to 800 calls a month. He answers the phone at two in the morning about very, very important topics. And Jeff is so kind to volunteer to share with you some really important information that we as faculty members should know. So take it away, Jeff. Thanks again, Kim. Really grateful for the opportunity to um, just share some thoughts about uh, risk avoidance and some of the uh, issues that we face working for the health system and giving medical care or other aspects of administration and operations. There's generally speaking a top five to 10 list of things that we see on a regular basis or advice that we give when we get called for some help. And I, I really like the fact that you've presented it this way because we really aren't scary. We are here as um, collaborators and colleagues to help um, folks that are rendering care to other people that need our help in a way that keeps them within regulatory frameworks and and make sure that we um, do the best care possible without running into some sort of liability exposure. First thing I would point out, which is really critical, um, is communications with our our patients and with our families and with fellow staff members. Um, It's not just about the patients, it's about colleagues and how we communicate um, to each other. And what's really important is to make sure that when we are communicating um, with with everybody else that's out there, we're doing it professionally, we're doing it responsibly, we're doing it in a way that is collegial, um, that we're not um, pointing fingers or casting aspersions. Um, I say that in a way because it seems like common sense to, to say that, but sometimes, you know, in very um, harried situations or in urgent situations, people respond in different ways. And sometimes the, what we think we're saying out of our mouth and what somebody else may be hearing are two different things. Mm. have to be just a little mindful about how we're communicating to families or patients when maybe they hear not such good news, for instance, mm. that may be um, difficult to hear. I mean, there are really good ways of doing that. We have experts that are really excellent at doing that. Um, and, and part and parcel with that, too, is um, following up on communications and things like tests. So anytime that somebody is in the gray zone of not knowing really where they stand with a prognosis or a diagnosis, um, it's really important to make sure that there is a system mechanism in place to make sure that we follow up with any kind of test results or you know, CT scan results or lab studies, uh, anything that um, would be important for a patient or family member to know. So communications really by far is one of the number one, um, I would say failure modes when we see adverse events for things that happen in the health system. We do root cause analyses here to investigate adverse events. Um, hands down, I would say, likely 80 plus percent of the time, communication is the number one issue. So that's why it was really important to bring that up today, I think. You're, you're addressing um, the, the health system and number one, 
communications. Isn't it ironic that everything we talk about with our faculty through our leadership programs, uh, just for basic emotionally healthy relationships at home, all centers on this soft skill of communication. Isn't it ironic that everything seems to come down to good communications? And I'm reflecting also because you have this the health science perspective clearly as a basic scientist, if you're in the lab and you perhaps don't interact with patients at all, it's the same, I'm sure a lot of the same issues because Jeff, you talked about with colleagues, the collegiality, the communication, the follow-up, building relationships happens regardless. So I think this, again, everything fundamentally comes down to communication. I think it's so ironic that our chief legal counsel here is talking about communication. Absolutely. And, and not just verbal communications, it's a bit of a segue into the second major issue that we have from a claims liability exposure point of view, whether it's um, you know, a regulatory issue or whether it's a standard of care issue, is documentation. Um, I would say uh, the second biggest key point I'd like to share today is when we are memorializing what we did, what we said, um, the plan relating to uh, medical care or further testing or communications with other providers or other clinicians, even on the research side, for instance, um, when we have collaborations, let's say with geneticists about certain things, um, or there's some sort of overlap between the research side of things and then the clinical care side of things, making sure that we have appropriate Um, communications by way of the written word is just as important as the verbal word. And we've actually seen sometimes issues where um, somebody may have speculated in the chart about a diagnosis and with good intentions of trying to list out things that it may be, but if they don't do it or communicate it or document it in the right way, and they give the impression that this is a diagnosis that may not actually be a diagnosis, then that can be a, a particular problem too to try to like clarify that later downstream. Um, and so we have to be very careful that when we are um, writing notes or doing handoffs with other colleagues and providers that we do it as succinctly and factually correctly and um, appropriately as possible. Oh my gosh, another another piece of valuable feedback. And I'm thinking the corollary, we had Dr. Doug Robinson talking about the lab and how to build a lab and lab notes and how important it is to have a standard operating procedure in at the bench. And this is the same thing, Jeff, right? Where you have to have this good documentation around when things are going to fall apart, it's the standard operating procedure wasn't there or someone misinterpreted what that note meant and what, what happened in the experiment and not the conjecture, but what literally did you do? So again, it, it's just, uh, I hate to say, like my grandpa would say, common sense ain't so common, but uh, this is just fundamental communication and not making assumptions. Absolutely. And uh, if this is a Great segue into like part three of this. And you mentioned it yourself about standard operating procedures. Um, Policy development is another um, critical area to get right to the best of our ability and being careful about what we put into standard operating procedures that are appropriately instructive, but then also, I would just say, are not so ambiguous or vague or nuanced that the people that are expected to follow that policy or procedure can come away with it with two or three different meanings. That's that's huge. And in fact, in litigation, for instance, we will be held accountable to what our policy is. And if we didn't follow it because somebody didn't quite get it, that leads to some difficulty too when it comes to def- to trying to defend against allegations. Ah, Jeff, we're, we're just totally like track a lacking here because I had an episode that dropping just before yours, just last week with Dr. Sarah Ammon. I always say Ammon because she's like, it's, think about it. Kim is saying it. I'm at the end. So I'm Ammon. And so when every time I say her name, she like rolls her eyes. She's like, you don't have to stop in the middle of saying Ammon. But Dr. Sarah Ammon did a great job and in talking about the how when she does interdisciplinary science from people in like six or seven different countries. So not just only different departments or divisions or institutions, but different countries. And she said, we will sometimes spend 
upwards of an hour. And I almost kind of like threw up in my mouth a little bit. I'm like, what? Talking about the definition of a term. Because like disintegration, as a just general sentence that I would say, I'm like, well, surely Jeff understands that word. But I'm assuming that the word disintegration or whatever means the same thing in your field as it did as in my field. And they, lo and behold, realize that as you're talking about ambiguity, that they they would waste time if they didn't invest up front in language and what if and making sure everyone understands very clearly what are we talking about. Otherwise, I'm going down this path, Jeff, you're going down that path. And then we get annoyed and frustrated with each other thinking, how in the world did Jeff come up with that? We clearly talked about, well, in your head, in your defense, that meant that. And I have no idea. So it really stresses the importance. And I love how you stress making things unambiguous and avoiding vagueness. Let's make sure we're all on track. And to someone like me, who's like hard charging, let's get her done. It's a real challenge for me to slow my roll, make sure we're all, are we clear without being obnoxious about it? But let me tell you what I think when I say this or hear this, am I, am I right? Are we talking on the same track? So this is just wonderful stuff, Jeff. Oh, I'm so glad. And um, you said slow down. Like I got the impression that, you know, in your mind, it's important to slow things down we talk about that a lot in our sessions, educating here about risk mitigation strategies, about you know the workflow and uh, the volume, for instance, of trying to get people from point A to point B through different procedures, that sometimes another key risk mitigation strategy is to just take a deep breath and slow down and think through the process before you just start acting because then there are things that can be missed by um, rushing or thinking you've covered something, but maybe didn't quite have the checklist that you should have had or gone through the checklist the way deliberately that you should have. Um, And so that's really important too. So that's a really good point. So the other um, thing that uh, I wanted to bring up, which is one of my top five uh, risk management points uh, for avoiding any kind of confusion or misinterpretations or even exposure to potential liability is the consent process. And I would say of the legal calls that we get on a regular basis, um, the bulk of them have to do with informed consent. And it's a combination of who is supposed to give informed consent, what if the patient can't give informed consent, or even Uh, to speaking about research subjects and making sure that the research subjects that are participating in studies, that you have an appropriately identified consent process um, and that they're aware of risks, benefits, alternatives, the risks of the alternatives, because the consent process really is about the patient's fundamental right to make decisions about their own body, what's going to happen with their medical care. And so oftentimes we run into situations where the providers may not be certain that they have the right person to sign an informed consent or have that discussion. Because after all, consent really isn't about just a piece of paper. It's about the discussion and making sure that people understand the consequences of their decisions with regard to the medical care in which they engage. So um, I would say, of the top five consent processes for the kind of the calls that we get is one of the number one things. And next to that kind of concomitant to that is ethical processes that surround medical care um, and making sure that um, we're doing things not just legally appropriately, but also ethically. And, you know, I am a member of also the ethics group here and I've worked um, very closely with uh, ethicists here about rendering um, ethical care, not just legally appropriate care as, as well. So whenever I get a legal call, for instance, as my, my colleagues will say, if they were on the call today, one of the first things when I get a question is, I ask myself, must you, can you, or should you? Ooh, I like that. Must you, can must you, you, can you, should. I know, I, I, you know, when I first started out, Many, many years ago, I kept getting these calls and I kept trying to figure out how to analyze them in my own head from a legal point of view, keeping in mind there's an ethical component. The first two really are legal. And so uh, must you is, is there a law, a regulation, a statute, some opinion that says you have to do this or you are absolutely not allowed to do it? 
Once you get past that, if the answer is no, there's no law or statute or regulation, then you kind of ask, can I do it under a law, regulation, or statute um, or other um, case law? And if the answer there is, yeah, you can do it, then the last question I always ask myself and the providers or anybody that calls is, should you do it? And to me, that raises um, the question of ethics. And, you know, I will go right to my colleagues that I work with all the time to say, I think we may have an ethical issue here. Can you help? Um, and also, we have ethicists on call as well, you know, 24-7. And so, you um, Oftentimes, we'll pull in an ethics consult um, impromptu to help resolve issues at the bedside, whether it's a consent issue or a decision-making issue, sometimes end-of-life decision-making issues. I mean, there are lots of um, laws relating to how to get to an end-of-life decision process under, let's say, Maryland law or other laws that are out there in in the country. And so clearly jurisdiction by jurisdiction, each state has their own laws about end of life decision making. And so um, you have to follow those laws um, to um, make sure that you're doing the right thing by, by patients' rights and also families' rights. Isn't this just so fascinating? I'm, I feel like you and I could have a whole other conversation just about the morals, ethics, and values. Because as you're talking, about the must you, can you, should you, again, as I, I'm trying to put on all my hat as, hats as a faculty member, and just basic, so there's clearly the legal obligation, the mandate that you are obviously expert at, and this is your passion. And I'm thinking, wow, how easily we can shift this concept of must you, can you, should you into our relationships in the labs with our families. Must I say this to this person? Can I say this? Am I by by authority allowed to say this? Should I say it? And it kind of reminds me back to my woman's Bible study group about gossip. I couldn't help but I wrote this down next to it. And the woman would say, before I gossip, I always think, is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it true? And so when you said, must you, can you, should you? I thought, oh my gosh, that sounds like my woman's Bible study thing. But it kind of, because everything kind of comes back to, the decency. And as you talked about ethics, it's morals, ethics, and values. What do we as an institution, as a legal institution value, what do we as a culture at Hopkins and fill in your institution values? What do I as a, in a, as a lab leader value with my colleagues? And as a mom or a dad or a partner, what do I value in my relationships with my significant others or my friends? Must I say this to protect this, you know, my child from getting injured? or my friend from making a bad mistake, can I do it? Am I equipped to do this properly or say this or give this a piece of advice? And really, should I? Is it any of my business? I'm just thinking about you. We could probably have a whole other hour conversation about the incredible value and the reproducibility or or transferability of these concepts to many different domains. So thanks, Jeff. This is awesome stuff. Absolutely. And it's been an absolute um, pleasure to have these. T- I love these types of conversations. And these are the types of conversations we have every day, focusing on the North Star of what we do here. And that's to make sure that if people need our help, we're going to do it in the best way possible. Great stuff. Love it. So I think you've talked about four things, communications, documentation, SOPs, and policy development, this informed consent process. Did you have one more? I do. I've got, I've got, I wish we had more time, but we can do another one. This is, I know. Um, Hey folks, sidebar here, Jeff's not listening, but who would have thought talking to a legal guy would, would, would be so much fun and so interesting. (laughs) We are a lot of fun. And um, by the way, uh, you know, the folks that I work with here, not only are attorneys, but they're clinicians. I'm a respiratory therapist in addition to being a lawyer. No way way. Um, we've got PAs, EMTs, nurses, and these are all your, our legal counsel here are kind of multifaceted. So we have all been at the bedside with sick patients, and then we all went to law school or vice versa. So Hold the phone. Hold the phone. This is another conversation. Respiratory therapist. Long story. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's another podcast episode. You remind me again of Dr. Sarah Ammon, who, who last week on last week's episode, you heard her talk about she started her career. She's a, oh gosh, like she as a peanut, she was like doing peanut farming. Literally, she's a 
who was a plant pathologist working in peanut fields. And now she's a cell biologist. And I'm like, what is this? People are just so interesting. As my mom used to, my mom used to say, who has more fun than people? And my sister and I would look at each other like, what do you mean? Like dogs? Well, what are people? People are so interesting. And that's something else you just taught me, Jeff. I had no idea. I thought you lawyers all just kind of sit in your own little worlds and don't and, and, and don't cross across tracks here. So that's fascinating. Um, yeah, I, we think so. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. But I guess the um, the last thing I would throw out there is um, one of the big risk concerns I've had, also being an RT and now um, a lawyer for many years, and and is that technology sometimes outpaces our ability to keep up with it. And what I mean by that is um, the, the technological world right now is so nuanced. It's so complex. It's got so many bells and whistles. And training on the technology is a critical risk mitigation strategy. And I don't think we, um, I think we could be better at it, for instance. You know, like when you get trained on, let's say, a new ventilator or a new CT scanner or something, oftentimes you'll see the vendor come in with, you know, some pizza and do a training session with people. Then the question then is the sustainability and the competency level of folks that are being trained. I mean, I think we have a good program here. Um, but one of the things I've been concerned about as I've talked um, with the FDA and some other groups nationally, Amy, for instance, is um, training is probably one of the number one exposure points for medical care in terms of the technology, making sure people really understand how that device works. Um, and also what the instructions for use are, or like what are the black box warnings, for instance, about that? I mean, I don't want to give the impression like we're out there running rampant with technology because we're not. But um, if you were to ask me one of the big um, failure modes potentially of, that leads to bad events would be not understanding the technology. Wow. So now you're just taking me in a whole different direction because this is something I would really am going to think some more about this. This is making me think, you know, as, as again, my brain kind of goes in a hundred different directions. It's obvious the importance of what you're talking again to the health system, talking about the health system, the the import of training and keeping current on training and new technologies and the new versions of the 2.0, 3.0, X.0, et cetera. And as a leader and thinking again, as a listener around the world about, well, I'm not in the health system. And so I can just disregard this fifth point that Jeff Natterman is talking about. No, because as a leader and as we train leaders and we talk to faculty members Think about this. How often do we maybe have the wrong person on the bus or hire someone, a staff person or have a colleague or someone you're training in your lab? And we make, again, make assumptions that they came from such and such training institution or they read the module or they, they did the online learning something, something. They should know how to use this piece of equipment or this software or to how to do this thing. And that assumption, well, I, I trained you once, I showed you once how to do this. We kind of skip ahead and then we'll kind of slam the person for, for doing it wrong or not quite the way we do it because, again, we, we don't invest enough time. Here comes a time thing. or I'm, I'm thinking of me and how I've made mistakes like this of going, for crying out loud, I, I tried thinking about all the way people learn. I gave you something to read. I gave you something to listen to. I showed you. I modeled it for you. You did it. I have shadowed you doing it. Come on. But I'm, I'm reflecting now on years ago, and I won't say where, someone who was in charge of budgets was not following up with giving us the numbers about percent efforts to submit this grant application. I kept thinking, what is taking her so long? That's her expertise. Seriously, come on, give it's just a number. What's in cell B14? What's the effort? Like, I have to fill this in. And to her credit, and being humble, she wa had walked down the hallway and said to me, Kim, did you get that spreadsheet? I said, Yeah, I got the same thing you got. She's like, I can't open it. I said, Oh, really? I'm thinking there's something wrong with her computer. I opened it and she said, See, it, you can't open it either. I said, What are you talking about? She literally did not know how to click on the Excel spreadsheet and expand the column width. So she had those 
funny dollar signs or whatever, whatever. She's like, see, how they're doing that information. It's all gobbledygook. It must be a glitch in the software. And I thought, oh my gosh, person XYZ, just click here and drag it. And she was like, oh, and that's a perfect example to me. I'd never forgotten that story because she didn't know what she didn't know. And I'm making an assumption that she's just being passive aggressive. She's being lazy. She's being derelict in her duties. Something's going on that I don't know about, but it was something that simple. So there's lots of ways we can go that it's creating a safe environment, a culture where she's like, hey, help me. And then I help her and understanding, listening to understand what's going on there. So I'll, I'll shut up because I'm sure people are like, shut up. We want to hear from Jeff, but go ahead. Jeff. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, you know, uh, we take for granted sometimes that what people know and what they don't know, particularly about safety, and, and this definitely overlaps into lab safety, um, where people need to know about eyewash stations and they need to know about you know, the chemical SDS sheets and things where they need to know what how to respond to a chemical spill or a splash or things like that. I mean, that's all part of the same kind of concept of understanding the technology, but understanding and, the, and getting properly trained in what you're doing. And then it bleeds over a little into weird things like, like you, you never would think about dry ice and packaging for a shipping product. And this is definitely on the research side of things as well. You know, there are rules about shipping in airlines, um, things that are packaged in dry ice because it's a hazardous material. And, um, you know, I recall once, you know, having a question about the FAA wanting to know about training and they will come and they will inspect your property and your bills of lading to determine whether or not the people that are packaging um, research material in dry ice are properly trained to do that for purposes of safety for the airlines. Now, you wouldn't think that that would apply to, let's say, a health system or to an academic center doing research, but it absolutely is applicable and is a risk to the organization and to the airline. So, Oh, my gosh. I'm reflecting on the, on the Omaha Steaks order I sent to my aunt. So <laughs> $200 of meat and it showed up and she's like, Kimberly, thank you so much for this beautiful gift of meat. It's so much. And is it supposed to have come to a thought? So I like, need to get people inspecting that dry ice at Omaha Steaks. <laughs> that, that's like kind of the world of, of risk management for academic centers or for, you know, when you have universities and health systems together is it's not just one or the other. It's There's a whole bunch of interesting regulatory nuances that we have to comply with um, and that there should be people identified in the organization that are accountable for making sure that we're, or you are compliant with that. And um, those are where the gaps get found out by regulators or surveyors. And, and that's where corrective action plans come into making sure that you now have it if you didn't before. Wow, so, wow, Jeff, I'm going to, you know, let you close us out here, but, but I also feel like we could talk for another hour or so. Everyone listening, I, I hope, you know, you're getting, you know, enjoying this as much as I am, because I, honest to goodness, never expected that I would have so much fun talking to a, a lawyer. This is great stuff. And if you want to avoid risk, I would encourage you uh, to reach out to your respective institutions and health systems, legal office. Clearly, Jeff Natterman is a very cool, good, great guy who understand what I really have appreciated. One of the many things, in addition to this great thing I wrote down, must you pan, you should you, Jeff, is that you get us. I mean, I think a lot of times faculty members, you know, we have so many pressures on us to, you know, see the patients, generate our reviews, write the grants, get the papers, be a leader, mentor others, be on a, perform administrative functions with very minimal resources and not make a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, oh, by the way, deal with a global pandemic and try to raise kids and dogs and plants and life and life and life. And sometimes, you know, we think that there's just so many, there's so much out there to get us. And unfortunately, in your profession, Jeff, you, you're on the short end of, of like the harbinger of doom. And as faculty members, we think if I got another threatening email, tell me I, I got to do 16 online modules for this, that, and the other. And we think, oh, but what I've learned from you is that that's an assumption that I have made. And I think a lot of us make without taking the time, again, here's time again, I guess, because I'm like over caffeinated today. So everything I'm doing is hundred miles an hour, but taking the time to see people for the, the depth and the breadth that they have. Jeff Nader is a respiratory therapist. And by the way, 
<laughs> doing chief legal work at Hopkins. So who knew? And that you're on our side. And I think that is the, the value of diversity in its broadest sense of bringing people to the table that you would think, well, why would he want to be at that table? I'll tell you why. He can bring some new nuance to the discussion, something to think about. Talk about interdisciplinary work. And so I, I just really appreciate everything you share with us, Jeff. And I'm going to leave some closing thoughts or however, whatever you'd like to say to you. Well, I am uh, ever so grateful, honestly, Kim, um, for you allowing me to participate in this today. I mean, this is really, I love these conversations because they are eye-opening for, for, every, for everybody, I'd like to think, but for me too, to understand um, where um, the providers and the researchers are, because it is really a dialectic and it's really a collaboration and a conversation to make sure that we're all aiming at that same North Star and, um, and it's just really a, an exciting trip to take with folks. And it, it, sometimes it gets bumpy. You know, sometimes you hit a rumble strip and you need to pull back into the highway. And that's kind of what we're here for. Like if you happen to accidentally rumble onto the strip, that's okay. That happens. No system is perfect. We're definitely here to be part of that team to help get us um, back toward that North Star. Uh, and you do a great job. Of it. Well, folks, I hope you have learned as much as I have and you've appreciated this conversation. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.